You're on. No. <laughs> uh, so, land managers and scholars have oftentimes underappreciated the importance of subalpine meadows and forests in the Pacific Northwest in their relationship to Native Americans. Uh, traditionally, these types of mountain habitats contain resource, animal and plant resources not found at lower elevations. And these resources brought Native people up from the lowlands into the Cascades during the summer to gather these plants. Mount Rainier, because of its height and breadth, this is a mountain that dominates the landscape, uh, contains little expansive subalpine habitats compared to many of the other surrounding mountains. And also because of these geological and subalpine habitats, it was established as a national park in 1899. The establishment of the park effectively cut off native use of the mountain. Ending, ending, it ended hunting and greatly reduced what plant harvesting, greatly reduced plant harvesting. It also create, helped establish and create a myth that Native Americans feared the mountain and therefore never went there. And this myth was largely reported, was, wasn't, was largely reported throughout, well it still is today, but began to be challenged by archaeological and ethnographic research in the 1960s. By the 1990s, uh, Mount Rainier National Park and the Nisqually Tribal Government came up with a memorandum of understanding. This agreement <coughs> would allow members of the tribe to harvest 14 vegetative parts of 14 different species and a wide assortment of berries. Immediate, almost immediately, uh, public employees for environmental responsibility and maybe some other environmental groups challenged the saying that allowing natives into national parks to harvest was a violation of the park's mission and threatened legal action over it. Nothing has really happened since the early 2000s because of, because of it, but, it's, but this legal threat is looming over the situation. And I think that the real need, the real objective for the park and the local native tribal governments is to find a balance between the park's mission and its obligations it has to these tribes because it's a federal agency. Um, and centered around my research, I think to get to that balance, we need to ask three questions, or I'm asking three questions for my research. First, how do members of the Nisqually tribe harvest plants? Second, what is the ecological effects of harvesting? And finally, is there a feedback relationship between the ecological effects and future harvesting practices? A large amount of this research has been focused on bear grass. Uh, bear grass is, primary, is used for production of basket trees for both decoration, it takes a good dye, and for structural components, in particular coil baskets such as the ones made with pine needles. Um, bear grass is harvested uh, by selecting one to four leaves, these at a time, and these leaves will have a very white base. Like this, all of these leaves have a white base, and they are very wide compared to younger, so mature leaves. They're removed three to four at a time. And larger stems of bear grass, they'll remove up to 15 leaves per stem. And as they get smaller, they remove less. Uh, in 2001, the park plant ecologists established this study to monitor the effects of harvesting bear grass. What she did was establish Six control or three control plots, three harvested plots, and within each plot took one meter by one meter samples where all 
where, an esti where we estimate the percent ground cover of all species that occur in the plot. I'm just going to talk about bear, how the estimation of bear grass today for this. And so we have years. She, her crew, did this research from 2001 to 2003. And in 2007, since then, I've been monitoring. Uh, the blue arrows are years where the Nisqually harvested. Harvesting occurs after, after the plants are monitoring. So like this harvest, if there was an effect, you would have seen it in 2002, not 2001. Uh, overall, what we see is an initial increase of bear grass and no significant difference between harvested and controlled indicating that harvesting does not affect the abundance of bear grass. Now to switch from a subalpine species, which is the traditional draw, but I suspect that going through, getting to the subalpines required using resources along the way, and that Mount Rainier as a protected landscape is becoming more and more important for a, as a possible source for these resources, partly because of our actions with forestry, agricultural development, and urbanization have reduced the abundance of low, low elevation use of plant resources. One plant that the Squally are interested in is a Patsisola, a princess pine. It's a medicinal, uses medicinal tea primarily as a blood purifier for the Nisqually. One family has a story about her great, their great grandmother saying that you drink a quart of this plant, of tea made from this plant, and you'll have new blood by the end of the week. So it's, it's, oh. <coughs> So harvesting is done by uh, breaking the stem off at ground level. It's a rhizominous plant, so we try, the aim is not to pull out the rhizome stem off and then we'll use it, either use it fresh or, or dry it. There are two general rules for harvesting. One is if the stem has a flower, you do not harvest it. And the second rule is if there are no flowers, there's a little sequence here, but generally no flowers in this patch, you would leave three to five stems behind so that it would produce seeds in the future. My initial plan to study how harvesting affects plant, how, how harvesting affects Pensisola was to establish sheep, a control plot in the harvested plot and take 120 samples from each of those plots. In those samples, I measure species frequency, which is a measure of, a, of a occurrence, percent ground cover, and stem density. Overall, what I've seen is no significant impact. So this is just for all three me three metri <coughs> metrics, but this is just looking at stem uh, stem density, and you see really no difference between 2010 and 2011 in either years. It looks like there's a little bit of increase in harvesting, but that's not that isn't statistically significant. So. <coughs> To kind of wrap this up, I didn't quite get into all of this, this information, but I've heard at least done two interviews with this, where the reasons for harvesting, or there have been definite demonstrations of knowledge about plant, plants habitat, very strong belief that their method of harvesting is not harmful to the plant, and their main motivation for harvesting is besides making baskets and getting medicinal uses, is that it helps connect them to their ancestors and to their, way of, their traditional way of life. These cultural aspects combine to produce a particular method of harvesting, and the, the, from all the measurements I've taken, it seems that harvesting does not, does not change the abundance of the plant or change the plant community. Uh, there are two, there's a lot of questions, but two big questions I have is one, 
what's the mechanism of this? How is uh, is this non-significance a product of how the plants are harvested, or is it just that the plants can be take, can be beat up really easily? And the second question is how does this non-significance in, influence cultural beliefs? Does it reinforce it? Which I think it does, uh, just because one harvester. Last year, she, we were walking up to the bear grass site, and she said, there's a lot more bear grass here than when we first started coming. And, and they equated it to this idea of if you don't use the resource, in their tradition, if you don't use the resource, the resource will disappear. And I want to thank members of the Nisqually tribe, and my committee members, and many people at Mount Rainier and the University of Montana, and, and on this note, many people have said that it was cold. This is what, it, what, what, what the parking lot at Paradise looked like last year, this week. And I'll take questions. <laughs>
and I haven't yeah. got any more information about why they do that. Thank you.